It's with great pleasure I welcome Professor Joan Stites from Yale, who is the deserved winner of the 2021 prize medal. She's well known for establishing a laboratory dedicated to the study of RNA structure and function. Joan earned her BSc in chemistry from Antioch College and a PhD from Harvard in her postdoctoral studies at the MRC Laboratory for Lenalec Biology in Cambridge, Joan used early methods for determining the biochemical sequences of RNA to study how ribosomes know where to initiate protein synthesis on bacterial messenger RNA. Her laboratory is dedicated to the study of RNA structure and function. And in 1979, Stites and colleagues described a group of cellular particles called small nuclear ribonuclear proteins, a breakthrough in understanding how RNA is spliced. Subsequently, her laboratory has defined structures and functions of many non-coding RNPs, including several made by viruses. I'm delighted she's found time to talk to us today on viral non-coding RNAs, approaching answers. Good afternoon. I must start out by saying how deeply honored I am to be receiving this medal. And that's mostly because the three years that I spent as a postdoc at the Cambridge MRC Laboratory for Molecular Biology are some of the most memorable in my life. I absolutely adored living in England and being at a lab rubbing shoulders with some of the most famous molecular biologists of the time was just absolutely awe-inspiring. At that time, I worked on messenger RNAs, but since establishing my own lab at Yale in 1970, uh, we've spent more and more time working on non-coding RNAs of various sorts. And as you see in the slide, it's not only cellular genomes, but also viral pathogen genomes that make uh, non-coding RNAs. And with all of these, the question is, what do non-coding RNAs do? Why are they there? And finding functions for non-coding RNAs is always difficult, but I think it's really a little bit easier to find a viral non-coding RNA function than a host non-coding RNA function. And that's because a host non-coding RNA can be doing absolutely anything. Whereas a viral non-coding RNA you would think would either be doing something that contributes to the viral life cycle or that raises the defenses of the virus or the um, counteracts the defenses that the host organism raises against the viral infection. Moreover, since viruses have small genomes, if they're going to devote some of that precious coding space to making a non-coding RNA, it ought to be doing something very important. And finally, as you all know, uh, the study of viruses invariably reflects on cellular functions and that's going to be very much the case in what I want to tell you about today. So the viruses that we've been studying for several decades now um, are those of the gamma herpes virus family, um, here, here uh, represented by Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, Epstein-Barr virus, and a little known monkey virus called um, herpes samuri. These all have large double-stranded DNA genomes that encode about 100 different functions. Uh, they infect lymphoid cells and have two main phases, a lytic phase where they make more virus and a latent phase where the DNA of the virus, double-stranded DNA circularizes and exists within the, intra, within the uh, nucleus of the host cell expressing very few functions. These are oncogenic viruses associated, as it says, with many human primate cancers. And I just want to briefly remark on something I won't be talking further about, the HSV. Uh, this virus infects squirrel monkeys, its natural host, uh, replicates, and is seemingly harmless. The 
the monkey hardly notices. But in New World monkeys, such as marmosets, it causes aggressive T cell leukemias and lymphomas. And still no one knows the, what, what the difference is there. So the next slide is a little overwhelming. I'm not going to spend much time on it. But it basically shows you the name of the non-coding RNA, or its RNP, over here when it was first discovered, the virus it belongs to, and how we're coming on the important task of finding functions. And what you'll notice is that there are a lot of years between discovery and some, some explanation for function coming up over here. The functions are very various. Uh, part of the reason is that it wasn't until recently that a lot of modern technologies came along that can tell us about associations of these viral non-coding RNAs with various host components, which is always a superb clue as to where to look further for function. Today, I'm going to be telling you about how we started with just one of these viral non-coding RNAs, one called PAN for polyadenylated nuclear RNA from KSHV. We still don't really know its function. Uh, we know that it's necessary for late protein synthesis and therefore for the production of viral capsid proteins and virus production. Um, the mechanism we think has something to do with the RNA um, manipulating the nuclear export of messenger RNAs, but we still don't know that. But what I am going to tell you about today is what we've learned, which is a heck of a lot, about um, RNA tertiary structure in general, starting with the uh, starting with our studies of the pan RNA. So what I'm going to be really telling you about today and where we're gonna end up is talking about stabilizing interactions that occur between the poly A tail and upstream double-stranded structures in RNA. And all of these are at the RNA, RNA level. And this is the heroic work, mostly of a wonderful postdoc in my lab, Sayed Tarabi. And it was started several years, a number of years ago, as a collaboration with um, people in Tom Steitz's lab on Anvidya, who was then a postdoc and now has his own position in India, uh, Jimmy Wong, who's still at Yale, uh, Kasio Tukowski, a research scientist in my lab, and, um, and two technicians who contributed heavily to this work. So, um, let me give you some introduction. Uh, KSHV, as you probably all know, uh, causes cancers, lymphoproliferative disorders, and immunocompromised people, such as those already suffering from HIV. Uh, it's a causative agent of these ugly sarcomas that you see over here. And in the lytic phase, it produces this pan RNA that I already mentioned, polyadenylated nuclear RNA, which was discovered in the mid 1990s, both in Don Ganim's lab at UCSF and in my colleague George Miller's lab here at Yale. Um, pan very much resembles a messenger RNA. It's rather short, about one kilobase, transcribed by RNA polymerase II, capped and polyadenylated by the usual host machinery. As far as we've been able to detect, it's never exported to the cytoplasm. And although it does have some short open reading frames, these are not conserved even in closely related viruses. So we don't think that that's what it's doing. The truly remarkable thing about pan-RNA is it accumulates to about half a million copies in the nucleus of the late KSHV infected cell, and therefore accounts for 80% of the polyadenylated RNA, which you see diagrammed over here. Um, just to put these numbers in perspective, the number of SNRPs in the nucleus to do all the splicing is about a million copies per nucleus. The number of ribosomes in the cytoplasm is about 10 to the seven in a mammalian cell. So this is a very, very large amount of this nuclear RNA. And what, the first thing that was discovered was that there's an element which is about 100 nucleotides upstream of the three prime 
poly A tail of the RNA that's necessary. And that was work that was done by Nick Conrad when he was a postdoc in my lab. He now has his own lab at UT Southwestern. And by mutational analysis, uh, he deduced that uh, sequences forming the structure shown here um, were necessary for stabilizing the RNA and allowing it to accumulate to such high levels. And he also got preliminary evidence that this region where you have this internal loop, uh, U-rich internal loop, um, somehow probably was interacting with the poly A tail and that was what was providing the stabilization. It wasn't until five years later that Rachel Mitten Fry, another postdoc in the lab, she's now at Denison University, was able to get crystals of a truncated form of the E and E. Oh, I should have mentioned the E and E stands for element for nuclear expression um, via its stabilization activity. So she had crystal structures of this um, complexed with oligo A9. And what we saw was totally unexpected, namely that the A's were forming a triple um, base pair structure with this U-rich internal loop. So over here you have the Watson-Crick base pairs, and here you have the Hoogstein bear pairs of um, UAU triple, which is shown up here. So this is the Watson interaction, Watson-Crick interaction, and this is the Hoogstein interaction over here. And furthermore, that that triple helix was then extended by A minor interactions where A residues uh, interact in the minor groove with a double helix um, in order to actually clamp the RNA. And there were a couple of things that were quite wonderful about this structure. One was that this was the structure that was predicted in 1957 by um, Gary Felsenfeld, David Davies, and Alexander Rich, simply based on hyperchromicity of uh, polymers of poly U and poly A. And they predicted that this was the triple that would form. They were absolutely correct. It was later backed up by fiber diffraction studies. And also in, in 2010, this was the longest stretch of triple helix that had ever been seen in a naturally occurring RNA. Before I go further, I want to tell you about the assay that we use to um, assess the stabilization activity of an E and E. And what we use is a beta globin reporter gene. And this goes back to the very early days of cloning when it was discovered that if you remove the two introns from the beta globin gene and try to express it, instead of getting a whopping amount of beta globin mRNA, you get a tiny, tiny fraction. And it turns out that that's because of instability. It's made but rapidly degraded. However, if you introduce an E and E or two E and E's, the pan KSHV E and E, um, into the region upstream of the poly A site, so this is a three prime UTR, then you get almost full stabilization and high levels of the reporter. So what I've told you so far is that the E and E is this RNA element. We've shown that it protects pan-RNA from deadenylation and decay by clamping the poly A tail. Uh, you saw from the crystal structure, it interacts directly with oligo A, and that there's a five long major groove, what's called a major groove triple helix, and extended by A minor interactions. I'll say more about those later. And this is functionally important for the stabilization activity. Um, it turns out that there are also possible CGC triples, and you can, in fact, replace one of the five UAUs with the CGC. Um, and that immediately raised the question of, do other viruses encode pan-RNAs with e and E's? And are there e and e like structures that protect cellular non-coding or even coding RNAs from nuclear decay pathways? The answer to both of those questions is yes. And I will very short, very briefly uh, just review this. 
Kaju Takowski, um, a research associate scientist in my lab, um, undertook a search of the viral database. Here's the PAN, KSHV PAN, E and E that we started with and looked for other structures that had a U-rich internal loop of this sort flanked by two double helices. And what you see here are some very closely related viruses. You can see that this structure can be either right side up because it is here, or upside down, and still have the possibility of engaging the poly A tail about 100 nucleotides away. Um, so different kinds of viruses. This one is interesting because this is an RNA virus that replicates only in the cytoplasm. And this was our first hint that the E and E structure might also be able to stabilize RNAs, not just in the nucleus from deadenylation and decay, but also in the cytoplasm. So, um, Gaggio also then looked at the genomic database, hoping to find structures like this in mammalian cells. He did and you see two of them here, but curiously, there were only two of them, uh, somewhat different, uh, occurring in well-known human and mammalian non-coding RNAs. This one is um, metastasis-associated lung adenocarcinoma transcript one, a long coding RNA that's, that's associated with the tumor genicity of lung cancers, and membeta uh, multiple endocrine beta, uh, which is the structural component of paraspeckles, which are little nuclear bodies. And in both these cases, there are predicted triple helices, uh, but separated by CGs that could possibly make a triplex and a duplex here. And both we and Jess Brown, a new postdoc in my lab then, um, and Jeremy Willits, who is then a postdoc with Will Sharp at MIT, um, predicted these structures and did biophysical experiments uh, such as thermal melting, gave results that were consistent with these forming triple helices and interrupted in the middle by some other, other type of structure. A couple of years later, Jess Brown was able to, again, in collaboration with Tom Stites's lab, to obtain um, high resolution structure of the mallet one ENE, which you see here. And it consists of uh, nine UAU base pairs, but there is also the predicted CGC, CG double, and several A minor interactions. Um, and the role then of these CG nucleotides in the middle of this sort of bipartite structure are to lock the register of the three prime end, which in this case isn't an exogenously added poly A tail, but one produced by processing of the pre mallet one transcript. Um, they enhance base stacking. Importantly, what they seem to do is to reset the triple helix. It turns out that if you stack triples on each other, they get a little bit out of alignment as you proceed and you need to sort of reset the, the triplex uh, in order to start again and have a second stack of triples up here. Um, and the stabilization of the reporter again depends on having the triple helix, the A minor interactions, the strong stems at the uh, duplex triplex junction and, um, and then forming this blunt ended triplex here. So, uh, but Kajio went on to search the entire genomic database and then found thousands of ENEs, mostly in plant and fungal genomes. And the reasons that they're thousands is that they are in transposable elements. There are over 200 different sequences, uh, all of the KSHV pan type, I'll show you that. And the question then is why were they prevalent in certain organisms and not so much, as, at least as far as we could find at that time, in mammals. And what we think is that they compensate for intron loss by stabilizing the, the uh, 
transposes RNAs, and this comes out of the work of beautiful work of Hitten Madhani at UCSF, who has shown that <clears throat> um, certain fungi, at least, have a system that degrades pre-mRNAs that have stalled spliceosomes on them. And if you think about it, these are organisms also that engage in horizontal transfer. So if you're going into a new environment, maybe everything isn't right and your spliceosomes don't work very well in stall. And so that um, increases the degradation of pre-messenger RNAs. So there would be evolutionary pressure to get rid of introns. But if you get rid of introns, then of course, you have this problem that I showed you with the beta globin that you destabilize your message. But if you put in a E and E element, then you can rescue. And we have more evidence for that that I'm not going to go into. So what do these E and E's and transposable elements look like? They look very, very similar to the one from the pan RNA of KSHV. But we also discovered a new type of E and E, namely what we call a double domain E and E, where you have one E and E sort of embedded in another E and E. So you have two triplex forming domains and other features that could then form A minor interactions, et cetera. And this is what they look like. And one thing that you can notice is that the distance in between these two triplex forming domains here um, is about, 10 or 11 base pairs, which is, should say to everybody here, hmm, about one turn of a helix. If one lines up a number of these, and this is only a small fraction, you can very easily see the conservation of the U residues that form the triplex. And there are usually four or five of them, sometimes six, but four or five seems to be the preferred number, both for the upper domain and then here plus here for the lower domain. But one thing that puzzled us from the very beginning was that Casio noticed that there was an A residue almost absolutely conserved in the double helix at the bottom down here. Here it is, bulged out and then two A residues in this linker region over here, which we now call the adenosine triad. We didn't understand for years and years what this was doing, but we now understand it, and I'll be telling you about that. So conclusion, uh, at this point, E and E's are found in messenger RNAs and these transposase messengers, as well as in non-coding RNAs. The triple helical stacks are limited, uh, certainly no longer than six, and they seem to uh, counteract the negative effects of intron loss and transposon mRNAs. But from here, um, I want to go on to um, tell you about much more recent work. Next thing that we notice is that double E and E's have this unique feature, namely that one strand of these um, double helices that flank the triplex forming region. One strand is pyrimidine rich and the other is purine rich. And so Syed Tarabi did the obvious experiment of just flipping the sequence and asking what would happen. And then measuring it in our in vivo stabilization activity using beta globin reporter. And what you notice is that the um, stabilization has almost gone away. Here is where all the AUs have been switched to CGs. You get greater stabilization. But again, if you flip them, it goes away. Furthermore, Syed was able to um, do the experiment where he took poly, a poly, strand of poly A and just in the test tube mixed it with a double E and E. He could see a very beautiful gel shift, as you see here. But if you flipped it, the gel shift was gone. So that was the point where I got very excited and said, okay, we have to have a high resolution structure of what's going on here because it looks like the poly A is making some sort of previously unknown interaction with the double helical stretch that's right here. And so several years ago, three, three four years ago, Syed set, up, set upon this task. The first thing was to determine what size poly A he should use. And here you see that you have 
homogeneity up to about 28, 29, which is the range in which he um, started his crystallization experiments. So he immediately did get crystals, but they didn't diffract beyond 10 angstroms. So they wouldn't give us the answers we wanted. And this went on for three years with Syed testing all sorts of different lengths of poly A and different ones of the double E and E's. Um, like he tried over 20,000 different experiments um, and, and shot something like uh, th over a thousand uh, crystals in the beam to see how well they they fracted. And finally, uh, in very, very late 2019, um, he obtained these crystals from a rice transposon, E and E, and they diffracted to about three, sometimes 2.9 angstroms. So this is the take home lesson. Um, here, I'm showing you what the structure looks like. Over here compares the native rice transpose on E and E structure with the construct that was actually crystallized, which just has changes the gray residues at the two ends. But you see here that it has the same stabilization activity in our in vivo assay and the same gel shift act activity in our in vitro assay. Here we're looking at two different views of the structure. And in this and all following slides, the purple is the poly A and uh, the green is the E and E. And over here you see a schematic. And what you might notice is that there's a gap in the poly A um, of at least, it turns out five nucleotides, which means that these are disordered. That's exactly where I thought, oh, we're gonna see something very interesting. We didn't see that, but what we did see and what I wanna spend the rest of my time tell you, telling you about is that there are multiple modes of interaction between double-stranded RNA regions and the poly A tail, including the formation of a three prime end binding pocket, which explains those absolutely conserved A residues that I mentioned to you earlier. And this was just very, very recently published in that science. So let me tell you about it. What were the surprises? One surprise was that the way in which the poly A lined up with the E and E's was opposite to what we thought it was. This is the five prime end and the three prime end, but there's no reason that with space in between a poly A tail can't do this sort of interaction. It turns out that as you might expect, the upper E and E triplex forming domain and the sequences surrounding it would look very much like those in the lower domain. And here's the intervening double helix. Um, so we've sort of divided them up and I wanna tell, tell, tell you about them. Um, that first what we see with the, with the upper stem, which has this purine pyrimidine bias, is a kind of novel A minor interaction that I'll tell you about. Then there's a quintuple base transition that's conserved here and also in many other RNA structures in the literature, but people didn't realize that it was a conserved structure. Uh, that transitions to the region with the major group triple helix, and then finally this very alluring three prime end binding pocket. So let me start at the top and tell you a little bit more. So classical A minor interactions involve the sugar edge of an A residue um, fitting into a double helix in the minor groove. What we see instead in these interactions here and down below are interactions with the Watson-Crick edge of the A and the Hoogstein edge, but also in the minor groove of the double helix. So here's the poly A and here's the double helix and here are the base pairing interactions that, that are being made. And it turns out that the pyrimidine purine um, distribution here 
is very important for allowing the structure, this is based on model building, to actually um, form adjacent A minor interactions. In the literature, there are some of these, but they were never sort of really pointed out as being a novel type of A minor interactions, but now we can line them all up and see lots of them. As we proceed on down, now we're gonna transition from these, these a minor interactions down into the double helical region. And it turns out that something quite different is happening in the rice transposon double E and E from what's happening with the pan E and E. Um, you can just see that from looking at the sequences here, looking at the structures here with outlining and some of the bases that stick out. But what's wonderful about the Quindock pull base transition is that it's in all sorts of other RNAs that are already in the, whose structures are already in the literature. And here we're just looking at it in a little bit more detail. So here's the poly A, the purple, and the E and E, the, the green. And it's these five nucleotides that we're talking about, which interact with each other in this way. Here are the A's and here are the, here's the E and E. Um, but specifically, as I just mentioned, there are lots of other RNAs that appear in the literature, whose structures appear in the literature. Some examples are the pre-Q1 riboswitch, uh, one of the CRISPR RNAs. And the one I like best is in the telomerase RNA component uh, near the pseudonaut. Uh, this structure was done way back in 2008 by Julie Feigen's lab using NMR to get the high resolution structure. And what you see here is you can exactly superimpose this transition uh, five quintuple base transition motif and the um, triple helix that forms then um, on uh, the telomer between the telomerase RNA and between our um, rice transposon double E and E structure with an RMSD of 1.5 angstroms, which is remarkable. So it's the same structure and it's there in the literature many, many times. So moving on down, okay, we come to the piece de resistance here. Um, and I already mentioned to you that this adenosine triad was going to be doing something important. And what's it, what it's doing is forming a three prime end binding pocket for the extreme three prime end of the poly A that you see coming down here in purple. And here's the E and E structure. And the way this pocket is formed is that this A down here comes up and stacks between these two A's. So that's A56 between A30 and A31 twisting the backbone of the E and E into this letter Z shaped structure. And of course, there's a lot of base stacking that's going on here. You see a side view and you can see A56 between A30 and A31, the adenines, and here's um, a top view so you can see the actual overlay. Um, but as to what's really going on and how this protects, here you see the three prime, the extreme three prime end of the poly A, that's the terminal um, ribose with its three prime hydroxyl and it actually makes a, a hydrogen bond with a phosphate residue in the backbone of the E and E. And here you see it in another orientation. Uh, space filling model of this is perhaps a little bit more informative um, here you can see that hydrogen bond between the three prime hydroxyl of the end of the poly A coming down this way. And here's the E and E that's been sort of twisted into this wonderful pocket structure by the A triad that you see right there. So that's basically the story on the structure. Um, you might ask, well, do we really have evidence that, for instance, the three prime end binding pocket is functional? Um, here, Syed has made mutations in the A triad, both there and there, and then done the in vitro gel shift assay, uh, what you see here. And you notice that, in fact, the affinity is lower and you get this extra sort of smear out of it. So 
it's certainly contributing there. And also by our in vivo uh, stabilization assay, this is the grand finale slide, you're not gonna see any more data, um, which shows both mutations in the uh, three prime and binding box, um, which are the ones down here, M13 and M11, uh, give a much lower level of stabilization. Um, also ones, these are ones that affect the purine pyrimidine switch of the two strands. And those ones are also very important. So those A minor interactions, those new, new kind of A minor interactions are also very important. And interestingly, the mutations that I thought we were gonna find at the very beginning in the middle of this uh, helical region of about one turn of a helix are the ones that have the least consequence. But in any case, we found a lot of interesting things, which I'd like to summarize here. Um, as I mentioned, the orientation of the poly A strand is different, but what's new are these watson crick uh, hoogstein face A minor interactions that are not the classical A minor interactions with the, with the sugar uh, face, um, which are also in the literature. So this is another conserved motif in RNA. Uh, this, uh, quintuple transition motif between minor groove interactions of the poly A to major groove helices um, certainly is there in a lot of important structures. Uh, and then finally, we have the three prime end binding pocket, which we haven't yet found in, in structures other than double E and E's, but we'll see about that because all these features appear to be modular, which means that we can now go and search the bodies of messenger RNAs and the three prime UTRs for places that the poly A might interact by forming some of these structures. And here I should mention the work from the Bartell lab and Kevin Struhl's lab in mammals and yeast uh, respectively, uh, showing that uh, helical regions in three prime UTRs seem to stabilize messenger RNAs. So perhaps through these types of RNA-RNA interactions. But finally, I just want to mention that, you know, thinking about evolution, everything I've told you about is all RNA-RNA, not involving the proteins that came along later and clearly interact with poly A tails, the three prime ends in very important ways, but that uh, it could have all started with these RNA-RNA interactions providing a rationale for why poly A with all its flexibility that you've seen, um, why we have poly A tails rather than tails out of some other nucleotide at the end of messenger RNAs. So with that, I wanna say thank you very much. And I hope that those of you who might have questions will uh, contact me um, about any questions you have. And here, I just want to acknowledge Syed Torabi Postdoc, who's the real hero of this story, kept having kept after it for over three years before there was any glimmer of hope. Uh, Kazio Tukowski, who's been a longtime associate, Anand Vaidya, who from Tom Seitz's lab, um, and the other uh, crystallographers who made real progress on triple helical type structures from my lab and the support we've gotten from many different institutions. So with that, I wanna thank you very much for your attention. And as I said, please send me questions if you have them. Thank you. Hi, Joan. Um, and thank you so much for actually um, agreeing to answer a few questions for the, uh, the members of the Microbiology Society. Of course. I'd just like to start by asking you about, you know, have you had one big eureka moment in your career? And um, whether you could describe how that moment came about? Okay, so it goes back to my postdoctoral work, which was performed at the um, LMB in Cambridge. And there I had taken on a 
problem that was a very challenging problem, and I can I can tell you the story about that a little bit later, uh, which was to try to figure out where bacterial ribosomes start protein synthesis on a messenger RNA and how they know to find the beginnings of open reading frames so that they can actually make the right proteins off of a message, because we already knew that there were multiple proteins on a on many bacterial messenger RNAs. And I had I'd done this project and I'd gotten some results. I'd gotten some sequences that corresponded to the beginnings of genes and we'd lined them up and looked at them. And in addition to the AUG initiator codon, there were purine rich sequences upstream, but they weren't uniform and they weren't uniformly placed. This is at about minus 10. And it wasn't clear what was going on. And then um, in, after I'd had my own lab at Yale for four years, I got one morning, I got a call from an Australian voice that turned out to be uh, Linda Garno, who said that he and his student had um, sequenced the three prime end of 16 sRNA. And it's a small subunit that initiates protein synthesis. Um, and they'd found that the sequence there was complementary to the sequences that I'd found, these purine-rich sequences upstream of the initiator AUGs, and that maybe it was a base pairing interaction. And I got very excited and set out to try to prove this and did some experiments um, that, um, that I thought biochemically at least, I won't go into them in detail, biochemically at least, uh, proved that there really was an RNA-RNA interaction. And I remember one night developing the film from the gel, showing that the structure could be melted apart, as you would expect if it's two RNA molecules interacting with each other, uh, and but that they were together if you didn't uh, apply heat and driving home and thinking, oh my God, this is happening in all our cells. Now, of course, it turns out this was specific to bacteria and isn't the way it's done in our mammalian cells, but it really felt like a eureka moment that I discovered something that, you know, that or I verified something that had been predicted, but wasn't really based on any sort of evidence. Yeah, I mean, it's just an amazing feeling, isn't it, when you've got yeah, yeah. those and you know that you know something that nobody yeah. else has ever yeah. known before, and it's potentially important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, absolutely brilliant. On the other side, what was the lowest point in your career, and how did you manage to get through it? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure it was the lowest, but a low point had come earlier in the story. Actually, while I was still in my three-year stint at the LMB, uh, doing my postdoc and trying to do this project. And the reason I had taken on this project in the first place was that when I arrived at the LMB, and I had gone there because my husband is an x-ray crystallographer, and it was known for its x-ray crystallography. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not too bad in molecular uh, aspects of cell biology either. Um, but a lot of people were talking about a project where you would bind ribosomes to a messenger RNA, use a nuclease to trim off the ends of the messenger RNA, and then use the new methods that Fred Sanger was, had just developed, or was in the process of developing, for sequencing the fragment and actually find out where those ribosomes are binding. Because some people thought they would get on the five prime end of the RNA and slide along to the first gene, and there were all sorts of proposals and nobody knew. Now, this project had been considered by at least a dozen other postdocs as a possible project, but they were all men, and they knew that in a couple of years, they were gonna have to have a story to tell to go back to the States and get a job. I, at that time, had never seen a woman professor in, um, in science or a woman head of a lab. I presumed I was gonna be a research associate in somebody else's lab, a man's lab, of course. 
And I thought, gee, this is a challenging project. Why don't I do this? It's really, really interesting and maybe it'll provide some interesting data. So I took it on. And after about a year of trying it and just not getting anything to sequence was a really, really, really low point. Mm -hmm. And I remember going along to Sydney Brenner and saying, well, maybe I ought to, you know, change projects. And he had another project involving tRNA modifications for me. And, but he said, he said, and here I'm not very good at imitating British, but he said, well, you know, experiments are like a marriage. If they go bad, you give them one more try before you give up. And so I gave this experiment one more try. I changed some things about the way I was trying to purify the ribosome bound fragments and all of a sudden it worked. And then the results came very fast after that. But it was, it was a real low and I'll, I'll never forget Sydney saying to me that it's just like a bad marriage. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> so if you were looking back, um, what advice would you give to your 25-year-old Joan? Yes, yes, right, okay. And well, it's the same advice as, um, you know, I would give to any young person. And that is, as you've already heard, there are both ups and downs in science. And it's not constant. The same thing doesn't happen all the time. And it's hard for young people to realize if they're down that it will come up if they keep working at it and keep slugging away. And so I think the realization that there are ups and downs and you have to persevere not by giving up, but by continuing to work through the rough spots, you'll really um, make a lot of progress. And that's hard to realize if it hasn't happened to you a couple of times, and it's something that does come with, with, with age and uh, having been in the field for a while, trying to, trying to get experimental results. So that would be both, uh, you know, my advice to young people and um, what I would have told myself at that age had I known, but I didn't. So, I mean, if you're starting out on an independent career now, um, I mean, always, I think when you look back, you look back with sort of rose tinted spectacles to some extent. Yeah. 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 But labs were much smaller, at least, you know, my yeah, lab, yeah. Bigger, but, you know, and I get the impression that to be successful now, you need a fairly large lab yeah. to actually handle. Well, well I also tell people, don't, don't fall into the fallacy of thinking that you can go into your office and direct people who are starting uh, research students or undergraduates who don't know what the heck they're doing uh, and get results. You have to be in the lab at the beginning producing those results. Yeah. Because you so, know what you're doing. So you you think that that is the, the sort of key to developing your independent career is what you oh, need? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You have to be doing it. You can't, you can't um, delegate it to somebody else because they're not you. They're not the reason you succeeded as yet. They will be later. Absolutely, but but not at the very beginning. Yeah. And well, well, there's some people, of course, who you know keep on doing their own experiments their whole lifetimes. I I'm sort of sorry to say that I'm not one of those, but uh, I have great fun with the with the younger people in the lab. It, yes, I mean I think one of the things that's changed over both of our careers dramatically is new technologies and keeping yeah. on top of new technologies which I is think. impossible but luckily young people adapt to them very quickly yes uh, yes exactly um so you do you feel as though the advice that you would give to a young researcher trying to develop a, an independent career now is different or is fundamentally the same as the advice that you would have given yeah, you know, myself um, I've always told people, and I think my 
our own research has reflected this, that it's there's something preferable about finding your own niche mm -hmm. as opposed to entering the most popular field and trying to compete with everybody else. And of course, you should keep your eyes, you should think and read and talk broadly and keep your eyes open because new opportunities sort of crop up from places you don't expect them. There's a lot of serendipity involved in science. And unless you're exposing yourself to all sorts of possibilities, you could miss that. Yeah, I think I absolutely agree. You know, find your niche and stick to it and make it your own. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's well, good, advice. good advice at any stage, I think. Well, thank you for that. I think it's been a brilliant sort of insight into just a few snippets of your career. Um, and I think it will actually, you know, inspire some young people to go on when they hit so. I hope so.